folks. Good morning and welcome to worship those who are here. Uh, welcome to worship those joining us uh, from home as well. It's good to be together. Uh, it's good to be gathered together by uh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Gathered together here for worship uh, to be renewed for a new week uh, to get the, uh, the energy to get what we need uh, to get through this, uh, the rest of this year, this wonderful 2020. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, uh, announcements, well, let me, let me start with sharing uh, for this week. Uh, a couple of folks we wanna continue praying for. Uh, Beverly, uh, Janice Cook's sister-in-law, uh, please continue to keep Beverly in your prayers. Uh, she's in ICU this week on a ventilator, uh, and so could use uh, all the prayers we could send her way. Uh, prayers for healing and recovery. Uh, prayers for, continued prayers for Bob Meyerhofer's uh, sister-in-law. Is there any news, Barb? Uh, I haven't talked to him for a couple of days, but they think she's going to be able to come home. Okay, good. So, so on recovering, uh, pray for continued uh, recovery uh, there as well. Uh, some sad news from Cindy from All Phase, her workplace. Uh, prayers for her boss and his family. Uh, his wife, who we had been praying for, uh, passed away this past week, early in the week. So prayers uh, for them. Also, a, a co-worker in the Springfield office, uh, Rick Hart, uh, passed away this week from cancer. So that's a bit of a cloud over, uh, over that workplace. Uh, so prayers for those families, prayers for all families who are grieving uh, this year, um, this holiday season especially. Uh, announcements, um, we've been collecting for Christmas baskets. Thank you everyone for your generosity for the Christmas baskets. Uh, now it's crunch time. Um, tomorrow, Monday, we're going to put those together. We'll meet at the church here at 11 o'clock. Uh, and assemble those uh, and have those all set and ready to go. Uh, so that's Monday this week. And then a Thursday this week uh, will be our Christmas Eve service. Now, we're not going to be here in the sanctuary for that. That is going to be recorded and will go on Facebook, um, uh, Facebook Live, just the way folks are joining us today from home. Uh, we'll all be able to get that uh, Thursday evening by 7 o'clock. Uh, for the Christmas Eve service. Um, I'll let you in on a little secret. It's probably going to go up earlier than that. But 7 o'clock is when we traditionally have gathered uh, for Christmas Eve, so that's when it's going to be up. Uh, it's going to be up at, at 7 o'clock, but if you want to go and, and catch that beforehand, you can do that uh, as well. Uh, the only thing I'd ask you to do in preparation uh, for the Christmas Eve service uh, in the buzz I sent out this morning, I've attached a little, a little program that you can follow along and sing at home uh, with the Christmas carols. Uh, I will send that out again on Thursday so that uh, if you haven't had a chance, you can print that out if you'd like. Uh, I'd also like to invite you to gather some candles and have them ready, a candle or some candles, uh, so that when we come to the candle lighting at the end of the service, uh, you can do that at home also and it can feel uh, it can feel like your own uh, candle lighting service uh, at home as well. And yeah, Linda. I just had one thing I wanted to mention. Uh, the uh, chicken that we get for our baskets uh, was to be picked up at the Mennonite Church. Then different changes transpired. So uh, the lady is going to deliver it to the church tomorrow morning. I didn't know if anybody that lives 
closer than me could possibly be here at about 8.30. Yep. I don't know when she'll get her. She's coming I, from I see, I see a volunteer in the back, Linda. So. You get together, get together with Ron, and we'll make sure someone is here to meet the chicken parts. All right. Uh, I'm impressed with, this is my first time uh, seeing you all in action doing the Christmas baskets, and I'm impressed with the level of uh, coordination and energy that goes into that. That's a, a great thing. And, and kudos to BCU, Bethel Churches United, for doing this year after year. I think it's a wonderful thing that they do. I will invite you to quiet your, your hearts and your minds as Carol plays an intro for us, and then we will be visited by our Advent uh, character, our Advent monologue as this morning.
join me in reading our Edwin litany as our little shepherd boy person lights our candles for us. Uh, please join me in reading. Hope is a candle once lit by the prophets, never consumed though it burns through the years, dim in the daylight of power and privilege. When they are gone, hope will shine on. Let's uh, continue worshiping by singing, uh, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. <laughs>
confess our sins to the one whose mercy endures from generation to generation. Will you join me in our prayer of confession? God, our maker, we confess that we are not ready to meet you. We offer us a place in your house, yet we find no room for you in our lives. You invite us into your eternal realm, yet we fail to welcome others. Forgive us, God of grace. Let your word of life be with us, so that we may truly believe that nothing is impossible with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Sisters and brothers, by the faith of Christ, your sins are forgiven. Blessed be the God of our salvation, whose mercy is everlasting. Astonishing God, send your Holy Spirit upon us as we await the coming of your Son. Fill us with good things that we may uh, conceive your reign on earth and glorify you according to your word through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. All right, our first scripture text this morning is from Psalm. Uh, 89, verses 1 to 4, and 19 to 26. Uh, listen for the word God has for God's people today. Uh, from Psalm 89. And the psalmist's words are also our words this morning. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy will be built up forever. Your faithfulness you will establish in the very heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Your offspring will I establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. Then you spoke in a vision to your faithful one and said, I have set the crown on one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. My hand shall always remain with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and steadfast love shall be with him, and in my name his horn shall be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. The word of the Lord. Thank you.
can't see it because of the mask, but I'm smiling. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Our second scripture this morning is from Luke uh, ver chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. Uh, listen again for the word of the Lord. When Elizabeth was six months pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David's house. The virgin's name was Mary. When the angel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, Don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever, and there will be no end to his kingdom. Then Mary said to the angel, How will this happen since I am a virgin? The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come over you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the one who is to be born will be holy. He will be called God's Son. Look, even in her old age, your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son. This woman who was labeled unable to conceive is now six months pregnant. Nothing is impossible for God. Then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just as you have said. Then the angel left her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God acts. The people of Israel uh, had waited so long for the Messiah uh, through generations, uh, the generations cycling from faithfulness to, to wander and then return, promise, turn to exile, then homecoming, and then lately, occupation for the people of Israel. Mary would have known the stories, knew the longing of her people, uh, the desire for the coming of the Messiah, a promise uh, for some time, somewhere. Little did she expect it would be her time and her, her where, but God acts in unexpected ways, reordering our world, choosing and using the lowly and the unexpected to bring new life into our world, uh, bringing fulfillment to the promises. It is the wonder of the unlikely choice and the satisfaction of the pent-up hopes of generations of her people that flows out of Mary as spontaneous praise uh, in Mary's song, the Magnificat, uh, the response to the angel's words to her, which follows the text we read this morning. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For God has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones, and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel. In remembrance of his mercy, according to the promises he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. This song, Mary's song, is the song of all Israel in this moment when the promises of God are coming to pass. God acts in Mary's time and Mary's place, arriving on the wings of an angel. 
Uh, we love this story because we love the idea of God showing up. God arriving in our world through humble and unlikely means. Uh, world changing events arriving in disguise. This Annunciation is one of the, uh, the most painted subjects in art history. And Mary's response, uh, Mary's song, a favorite musical theme. We love this, this story. Uh, we love it, but do we believe it? I like the image of the Christmas angel, partly because uh, unlike Santa, that seasonal icon turned capitalist sellout, Unlike Santa, the angel rarely, if ever, takes employment heralding some unbelievable holiday sale. I like the Christmas angel prevalent in the cultural media uh, of this season. This time of year, there are angels all around us. Uh, in our movies, uh, the modern stories we tell, there's Clarence, uh, the inept angel of Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life. Clarence, the angel, sent to George Bailey in his fit of despair to show him that, in fact, contrary to his belief, George's existence has been a favored one. Then there's Dudley, the conflicted romantic angel of the bishop's, bishop's wife, uh, both in the 1947 version with Cary Grant and Loretta Young and the 1996 remake uh, called The Preacher's Wife with Denzel Washington and Whitney Houston. Uh, even the, spirit, the spirits of the various and sundry versions of Dickens' A Christmas Carol serve a, as a type of angel, a spirit from beyond, offering the insufferable Scrooge a new perspective, uh, a chance for redemption. So apparently it's okay in the holiday season to tell stories of angels. It's okay to place them prominently uh, on the top of our Christmas trees, but at any other time of the year, try mentioning angels in mixed company and some might think that you've been just a little touched by an angel. We wanna believe in angels. We wanna believe that God enters our world and acts, lifting us out of our lowest state especially if our low estate is a home on the brink of foreclosure and a mortgage that is underwater and sinking fast. We want to believe God enters our world, filling the hungry with good things, even when the hunger is for meaning and purpose and hope. We want to believe that God sends the rich away empty when the entangled web of stuff and responsibility strangles the life out of us. We want to believe in angels. But we have this inner voice, the unbelieving modernist, like the late Christopher Hitchens. This inner atheist is witty and erudite, too, too sophisticated to believe in angels. In his book, God is Not Great, uh, Hitchens treats the Annunciation, he treats this story as preposterous, worthy only of mockery, by the way. Hitchens doesn't care for the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, either. Uh, he refers to it as the best loved of all American sentimental movies. An engaging but abysmal film, he calls it. Well, to each their own, I guess. A realist, uh, Christopher Hitchens is a realist who never needed or wanted an angel or deus ex machina to save him or reorient his world. Uh, Hitchens was all about coming to terms with with the world as it is, rather than fixating on how he wished the world might be. Still, despite that inner voice, still I want to believe in a God who enters our world and reorients it, bringing peace and justice, lifting the lowly, filling the hungry, and choosing uh, an unwed teenage girl for a role of great honor. I want to believe that God's shalom overturns the world's assumptions about what matters uh, and what doesn't? And because I want to believe, I'm ready to think that some of my own experiences of inspiration, of what I might name in hindsight as divine guidance, uh, perhaps some of those hunches and leadings compare in their own way to the Annunciation. I've never seen an angel, but my lesser experience is just as importantly 
God coming, breaking into my world, into my life. And it's this kind of lesser uh, to the greater type of analogy that Denise Levertov makes in her poem on the Annunciation. So this is Denise, Denise Levertov's Annunciation. I know you can't read that, it's too small, uh, but I put it up there uh, just for the record. We know the scene, the room variously furnished, almost always a lectern, a book, always the tall lily, arrived on solemn grandeur of great wings, the angelic ambassador, standing or hovering, whom she acknowledges, a guest. But we are told of meek obedience. No one mentions courage. The engendering spirit did not enter her without consent. God waited. She was free to accept or to refuse. Choice integral to humanness. Aren't there enunciations of one sort or another in most lives? Some unwillingly undertake great destinies, enact them in sullen pride, uncomprehending. More often, those moments when roads of light and storm open from darkness in a man or woman are turned away from, in dread, in a wave of weakness, in despair, and with relief. Ordinary lives continue, God does not smite them, but the gates close. The pathway vanishes. A poem by Denise Levertov, Annunciation, from her uh, collection, A Door in the Hive, published by New Directions Publishing. God comes. God enters our world in unexpected places and surprising form. God comes, and this is the wonder uh, God comes despite our skeptic uh, skepticism and modern unbelief. An angel came to Abram and Sarah with the promise of a child, and, and Sarah laughed with derision. But her unbelief did not stop God's grace or God's promise. The angel comes to Mary, and she is, is incredulous and much perplexed. How can this be? But God comes anyway. <coughs> Let me tell you a story. Uh, Arlen came home tired and emotionally drained once again. Uh, his days were filled with darkness and sadness, but what he remembered each night when he came home were the points of light, a grace shining like the face of God amid routines of illness and death. Uh, Arlen was sitting down to his container of reheated Chinese takeout when the angel appeared. The year was 1989. For those of you uh, who remember, this was before the internet and email. Uh, it's the year that saw the beginning of the end of apartheid in South Africa. The Exos, uh, Exxon Valdez spilled 11 million gallons of oil in the ocean just off uh, Alaska. And baseball's World Series between the Oakland A's and San Francisco Dodgers was interrupted by a massive earthquake in California. Uh, more to the point, for Arlen, it is the decade that the world came to know HIV AIDS. And those who remember the 80s will remember the stigma, and the ignorance that surrounded the illness at that time. Uh, Arlen had been to the hospital again that day, been to visit guys who were living and dying at the time from HIV AIDS. Arlen, like many of the other Christians at the time, hadn't been sure what to think about AIDS. That is, until his brother, James, contracted the disease. And then Arlen's love for James overrode any squeamishness or qualms he might have had, and it became less a matter of knowing what to think and more a matter of love. And Arlen became a fixture at the HIV clinic on the, the uh, 13th floor of the General Hospital downtown. There he got to know other folks like James who were dying from HIV AIDS. Uh, he watched them walk painful journeys of shock and anger, grief and resurrection, a resignation. His heart broken with every setback and he rejoiced with every smile, every gesture of care and support, every small victory 
uh, brief moments of joy in larger uh, losing battles. Seeing the pain and loneliness, the need of this community that he had been initiated into, Arlen wanted a church, any church, to reach out to these men, to care for them and to care about them, uh, offering them and showing them Christ's love in their moment uh, of fear and anxiety and illness. It soon became clear, at least in the 80s, that that wasn't going to happen, when instead certain evangelical church leaders labeled this the gay plague. Then it became clear that those uh, with AIDS could expect little help from established uh, church structures and Christian institutions of care and hospitality. Instead, spontaneously, surprisingly, grassroots uh, networks of care and support sprang up among these communities of men most directly affected by the disease. And they built, uh, they built hospice homes and established support groups and became the face of God to one another. Uh, who are they, you may wonder, to build a house of love and care? It was as part of one of these informal and unstructured network of caring friends that Arlen walked with these men, that he provided uh, information and counseling, uh, care and support every day as a chaplain of sorts to those who had been cast out of church homes. The angel greeted Arlen over his chow mein noodles. Grace to you, favored one. And Arlen wondered, well, what in the world is going on now? I'm so tired, I'm hallucinating. Uh, he thought, but the angel didn't go away. Uh oh, don't worry, the angel told him. You're not going crazy. I was sent to tell you that the care and compassion, your care and compassion, has not gone unnoticed and to tell you, you have found favor with God. You will show the face of God to those whom the church has turned its back on. You have already seen the care and love, the compassion and ministering one to another that occurs amongst them. This has been your sign that these men are worthy of God's love and compassion. How can this be, Arlen wondered. The power of the Holy Spirit has overcome you, said the angel. That is where your care and concern come from. That is why you do what you do, putting in long, thankless days, caring for men who are angry and lonely. The power of the Most High has fallen like a shadow over you. The glory of God envelops you, and the face of God will shine around you like a brilliant, radiant circle of light, and you will witness to God's love for the world. Well now, as modern day enunciations go, that isn't quite what you'd expect, is it? But then what is there in our scripture that anyone would have expected? These are not scriptures about how God comes and shines in the world as we would expect. These are scriptures about God's radical freedom, about how God can and does shine in the world in surprising and unexpected ways. Not because we believe, but despite our unbelief, despite our skepticism and incredulity. God comes, God came, God comes, God is coming. May we be prepared for God's coming this Christmas and every day. Now to God who is able to strengthen you according to the gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages but is now disclosed according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever. Amen. And will you join me in a, a, an affirmation of faith? Let's read this together. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. In Christ, God gave us a glimpse of the new creation. He has already begun and will surely finish. We do not know when the final day will come. 
In our time, we see only broken and scattered signs that the renewal of all things is underway. We do not yet see the end of cruelty and suffering in the world, the church, or our own lives. But we see Jesus as Lord. As he stands at the center of our history, we are confident he will stand at its end. He will judge all people and nations Evil will be condemned and rooted out of God's good creation. There will be no more tears or pain. All things will be made new. Thanks be to God. And we'll continue uh, in worship in prayer, if you'll bow with me. Watching and waiting for the coming of, of Christ, we pray for the promise of a new creation, saying, Come quickly, Lord, our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray for the church. Fill our mouths with the song of your unending love, O Lord. May we never stop proclaiming your faithfulness from one generation to another. Come quickly, Lord. Our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray for the world. Come and dwell among all the people of the world. As you made your home with your people in ancient times, make your home among us now. Come quickly, Lord. Our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray uh, for this community. By your power at work in us, use us to bring healing and freedom, liberation and comfort, and to share the good news that you walk in our streets. Come quickly, Lord. Our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray for loved ones. Remember those who are hurting or searching, uh, even when they feel that all is lost, hold their desire and dreams in your heart. Come quickly, Lord. Our hope is in you. God, our hope, as the promised day approaches, fill us with the joy of your Holy Spirit and strengthen us to serve you faithfully through Christ who is coming to reign. Holy God, your love is magnified in the gift of your Son, whom you so freely share with us. Bless the gifts that we offer to lift up the lowly and fill the hungry. In your coming reign of justice and peace, uh, and peace in Christ's name. And now we lift up to you, O Lord, our hearts and our lives for healing, for mission, for blessing and redemption. Hear us pray, O Lord, as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Joining Mary's joyful song, our souls proclaim the greatness of the Lord, and our spirits rejoice in God our Savior. With humble and grateful hearts, we offer unto God uh, what God has given us.
come to Bethlehem and see. That's your invitation to, uh, to pull up our Christmas Eve service and uh, watch it. Come to Bethlehem and see. I'll send you with this charge and benediction uh, into this uh, holiday week, into this holy week. Do not be afraid, for God is with you and will strengthen you in your journey. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Magnify the Lord and rejoice, for nothing is impossible with God. And the blessing of God who creates, redeems, and restores be with you now and always. Amen.